the Bible reads, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. That's confidence. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Holy Father God, thank you for the season of prayer that you've given us this evening. And Holy Father God, I do pray now, very simply, that you will... Uh, Grant me your energy, your supernatural strength, uh, your unction, your anointing, and the power of your Holy Spirit to preach your holy word and your holy gospel. Uh, Lord, I pray that Christians would be challenged and encouraged to pray to you, God Almighty, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in faith believing and that they would pray without ceasing, and that they would pray for days and weeks and months and years until you call them home. Help them, Lord, and help all of us to pray without ceasing. And then, Lord, we pray that you'll have some tonight to pray over, to pray the sinner's prayer. Open their blinded eyes, unstop their deaf ears. hear their prayers, and Lord, the, when they pray the sinner's prayer, when they believe in their hearts, in you, Lord Jesus, and Lord, save their souls, even tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard Trench said, prayer is not getting man's will done in heaven, but getting God's will done on earth. In our last few messages in this series, we have been looking at some background knowledge and information regarding this passage. I do this unabashedly because I want you to understand the word. As I was growing up uh, as a young Christian, after I got saved December the 19th, 1979, what hooked me to Jesus the local church, the Bible, is I was around some preachers who plainly uh, taught and preached the word where you can understand it. And those preachers who took the time to give me some historical uh, background knowledge regarding the text. Those preachers that uh, took the time and they, they, they would bring some other things to bear to enlighten the text in my mind. Those are the preachers that I gravitated to. So 
I got saved in a good Bible believing church, but they poo pooed on Bible college and seminary, which they call the cemetery. Uh, but as I was going in the Lord, I guess God was preparing me to preach uh, full time as an evangelist. I didn't know what he was doing at the time. But he wanted me to go to Bible college and seminary so that I would not just get behind the pulpit and rab back and, you know, uh, chase rabbits and just say the same things over and over again. But uh, to be able to give people the word. Dr. John McNeil Jr. of Atlanta, Georgia had a, a big part in that as well. Uh, he showed me the power, him, Dr. John McNeil Jr. and other preachers showed me the power that is in the word. When the word is preached, you don't have to shout if you don't want to. You don't have to sing song preach. You don't have to put on a show. You just stand flat-footed and explain the word to people. Make sure they understand the word because that's what's going to hold them. Yeah, you know, you, you will share some applications in point one, point two, and point three, and we're going to get to that in this message and, and in this series. But uh, you are going to get more out of this series and out of this message if you understand the text. That's where the power is. It may not be, it may not be sexy as some people would say. It may not be exciting, but it'll be deep, and it'll reach you in the deep areas of your life. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in this message, we are going to continue looking at what John has to say about having confidence in prayer and how to pray for our fellow Christian brothers and sisters in Christ who are in sin. Dr. Warren Worsby, who is now home with the Lord, who fought the good fight by the grace of God, said Christians do not practice sin. We see. If you're born again, if you are a child of God, you are not going to practice sin. You may fall and slip every now and then, but you're not going to stay in it. It's just, it's got this, I don't see how you can do it. That's the difference between a true Christian, a born-again Christian, and a, and a, a, a so-called Christian uh, who has church membership. They can stay in it. It doesn't bother them. But a true born-again Christian, they can't stay in sin all their lives. It's, it's, it's going to bother them to, to no end. They're going to have to find a place to go and apologize and confess their sins and repent. 1 John 5.18 says, We know that no one who is born of God sins. 1 John 3, 9 says, No one who is born of God practices sin. If you're truly born again, you cannot continue to be a liar, a fornicator, an adulterer, an adulteress, disobedient and rebellious to the authority over you. If you're born again, you, you, you just can't do that. At some point, you're going to humble down and you're going to do what you're supposed to do. One who is born again does not practice sin. They don't stay in sin. They might fall flat on their face, but they will get up again. I remember evangelist Carl Hatch uh, coming to uh, that white church down in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, one week, and he ran back and preached a sermon titled, You Can't Keep a Good Man Down, 
He came from that passage that talked about how that a just man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. See, a true Christian, they may fall, but they're going to get back up. They're going to dust themselves off, and they're going to ask God to forgive them in the name of Jesus. And they're going to get cleansed through the blood of Christ. And they're not going to make a habit of it. Of it. If they fall again, they're going to confess their sins and repent. And they're going to ask God, please, God, help me not to do that again. Lost church folk, religious folk, Pharisees and Sadducees, they don't do that. They just continue on with their sneaky, devilish selves in their adultery, their side pieces, their homosexuality, their swinging. They just go ahead and have no, they, they, they're religious, but they're lost. They have no compunction about the evil they're doing, but a truly born-again one, and, and I have to just tell you and warn you in this day and time, don't think because somebody says they're saved or a preacher that they're saved. You need to examine their fruit, their, their track record. Occasional sins are not here in view, but habitual sins practice of sin, the practice of being mean, the practice of being disrespectful and disobedient to your parents, the practice of being nasty, the practice of a, having a bad attitude, the practice of adultery, the practice of fornication, the practice of pornography, the practice of whoredom, the practice of homosexuality. Because a believer has a new nature. He's born again. This is why you hear me say nowadays, you know, when I talk about saved people, they are born again saved Christian people. I got to say all of that now. <laughs> I got to say all of that because I don't be believing. Some of these folks are saved. They, they've been born again. They may have a good personality, but they've never been born again. They might be slick, but not saved. He has new desires and appetites and is not interested in sin. See, this is why some of you true Christians, you try to sit down and look at a show and it just you just shake your head all through the show. It's just, you just can't stand it. It's so vain and so wicked and so vile and so and so not even uh, worth even looking at you just get the remote control and change it because you can't stand it there's somebody living on the inside of you shaking their head his name is Jesus see that's why you can't sit through some stuff like some so called Christians do a Christian faces three enemies all of which want to lead him into sin. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world lies in the power of the evil one. Satan, the little G-God of this age, and the prince, of uh, this world, uh, this evil world. He is the spirit who works in the children of disobedience. He drives the rebellious and stubborn and mean and hateful children of disobedience. He controls them, and they allow him to control them. Satan has many devices for leading a believer into sin. Satan tells lies. So many young men, so many young women have been duped by Satan, bamboozled, and run amok and destroyed by Satan because they believe the lies. And I hate to say it, this generation call the millennial generation, they're more gullible than any of the generations above them. 
so easily deceived, so easily taken advantage of. Believe everybody but God, Jesus, and their parents. Do you know any young people like that? They believe everybody, everybody else is lying, and it's rooted in pride. And pride and stubbornness and rebelliousness and witchcraft and foolishness. They believe everybody except God, Jesus, and their parents who love them. This untoward generation. Satan, as he did, he lied to Eve. And when men believe his lies, they turn away from God and disobey God's truth. Or Satan may inflict physical suffering as he did with Job. We're reading about Job right now in the morning. And the standing in between the living and the dead service. Reading the chronological Bible. And I tell you, the chronological Bible gets you on down the road. We're already in Job. And we just started. In David's case, Satan used pride as his weapon and urged David to number the people and in this way defy God Almighty. Satan is like a serpent who deceives and a lion who devours. The devil is not playing with you. He's out to deceive you and to destroy you to consume you, to eat you alive. Get that picture in your mind. He is a formidable enemy. He's been around a long time. And he's not playing with you, and he's not smiling with you. Oh, he'll put on the dog. He'll, he'll transform himself into an angel of light. And look all cute and beautiful and all of that. He knows how to do that to deceive you. And then like a wolf, like a lion, he'll chew you up alive. He's done it to many. Many right now tonight are on the sidelines. Because of the devouring lion, Satan. Then there is the problem of the flesh. The old nature with which we were born and which is still with us. True, we have a new nature within us, those of us who are truly born again and saved. But we do not always yield to our new nature. Some people who claim to be saved, they act like they never yield to their new nature. I don't even know if they have a new nature. Somehow, some Christians lose their new nature when they go to bed at night and they wake up in the morning and they're looking like a devil and acting like a devil. And then when they get a little coffee, they can, they can regroup and, and uh, put on the dog a little while, I guess. But the thing about it is, if you have Christ living in you, you ought to be the same all of the time. There's no such thing for a born-again Christian of getting on, getting up on the wrong side of the bed. There's no such thing. They have the joy of the Lord and the cheerfulness of the Lord in them. And it is unshakable. And it is stable. The world is our third enemy. It is easy for us to yield to the desires of the flesh the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. The atmosphere around us makes it hard for us to keep our minds pure and our hearts true to God. Then how does a believer keep from sinning? 
1 John 5, 18 gives the answer. Jesus Christ keeps the believer so that the enemy cannot get his hands on him. He, Christ, Jesus Christ, who was born of God, keeps him, the believer, and the evil one does not touch him. The King James Version here gives the impression that a believer keeps himself from sin. This is what Dr. Worsby is saying. I don't see it that way. I've never thought that. But that's the way he sees it. But this is not what the verse says. Of course, it is true that a... Uh, Christian must keep himself in the love of God, but it is not true that a Christian must depend on himself to overcome Satan. You will lose every time. Peter's experience with Satan helps us to understand this truth. Simon, Simon, said Jesus, behold, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. In other words, he demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, once you have overcome Peter, strengthen your brothers. To begin with, Satan cannot touch any believer without God's permission. Never forget that. And we're reading Job right now. Read Job and you'll find out that that is the case. That is the principle. Satan wanted to sift all of the disciples. And Jesus gave him permission. But Jesus prayed especially for Peter. And his prayer was answered. Peter's faith did not ultimately fail, even though his courage failed. Peter was restored and became a mighty and effective soul winner and evangelist, preaching the gospel and thousands getting saved. Whenever Satan attacks us, we can be sure and rest assured that God gave him permission to do so. And one of the reasons we learn from Job this morning, or we recall from Job, is see Satan be coming before God saying, What about what about that old, old, old evangelist Daniel White the third? You got a hedge about him, take that hedge down, I guarantee you he'll curse you. To your face. And the devil has done that many times. And I've never cursed God. Skin for skin. Let me touch his body. And he'll curse you to your face. His wife will say to him. Why don't you just curse God and die. I'll have your, his wife turn against him. While he's sick. And, and that has happened. And I, you know what I did? I just turned to the wall like Hezekiah and King Manassas and started praying. And God healed me and raised me up. By the grace of God. Without going to the doctor, without going to the hospital, I had to just pray. Turn you. And sometimes you be in so much pain, you got to turn over to the wall. Like Hezekiah and pray and get, get a hold of God looking at that wall. 
Oh, yes. Uh, now, Satan can do a number on you, but he can't do it without permission from God. And it's a test, people, to see whether or not you're going to curse God. To see whether or not you're going to retain thine integrity before God Almighty and be faithful. And if God gave him permission, he will also give him power to overcome because God will never permit us to be tested above our strength. That's our loving God for you. One of the characteristics of spiritual young men is their ability to overcome the evil one. Bible tells us, their secret, the Word of God, abides in you. The Word of God abides in you. Part of the arm of God is the sword of the Spirit, and that is the Word of God, and this sword overcomes Satan every time, every time. I just told you how to resist the devil, folks. You've got to learn how to say no. Those of us who struggle with overeating, the sin of gluttony, the sin that is accepted by many Christians, you've got to learn how to say no to your favorite foods when the devil comes and tempts you. You're in your flesh. And some of us are fasting right now on the Daniel fast, and we're doing it with a twist. Eating one time a day, doing that intermittent fasting. It's a powerful tool once you can get into the groove of it. If you can eat one meal a day, maybe drink a, drink a little shake in the morning, some tea, green tea, And have your meal around one, and then go on without eating anything else. Maybe some nuts, maybe, something like that in the afternoon, evening, okay, fruit, if you want to. And have another shake, and that's it. You don't see food until the next day, that time. That'll help break that, because you got to say no to two major meals. You gotta say no to some good food. I'm just using that as an example, but I'm here to tell you, uh, some of you have not learned how to say no to the devil, how to resist the devil, and how not to yield to temptation. But if you are born again, if you are a child of God, by the grace of God, you can do it. And God's got your back. Now, why is all of this important to prayer? Because sin in your life will destroy your confidence in prayer to God. Because you're going to know that God is not going to hear your prayer because you're in sin. Sin will mess up and discombobulate your prayer life more than anything else. You can mark that down. So if you want to have confidence in prayer, and uh, you want to know for sure that God is hearing your prayers and answering your prayers in his good time, you need to make sure you keep the sin out of your life. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you for your holy word. For your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for the message tonight. And Lord, help us to realize... And remember 
This old saying, sin will take us further than we wanted to go, keep us longer than we wanted to stay, and make us pay more than we wanted to pray. And may I add, keep us also uh, back from praying as we should and having confidence in our prayer life to you. So, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to resist the devil, resist the world, and resist the flesh, and walk in the power of your Holy Spirit, and pray without ceasing, each and every one of us who name the name of Christ. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, dear friend, if you're with us tonight, and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, in the free pardon of your sins. Your first prayer needs to be what we call the sinner's prayer. First, please understand with me that you are a sinner, just as I am, and that you have broken God's laws. The Holy Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have done evil in our lives before God. We all have committed sins such as lying. I know it's hard to admit, but it's true pride, stealing, coveting and lusting in our hearts after things and people, dishonoring and disobeying our parents, disrespecting our parents, dishonoring God by taking his name in vain and lying on him. How wicked is that? Cursing and using his name. Some people under their breath thinking that nobody can hear them, but God can. Sin. We all have sinned against God. Second, Except the fact that, the, that there is a penalty for sin, for the Bible states in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And this is very sobering, but we're all going to die. We might as well accept that. And stop running away from that truth and get ready for your death. Some of you are ready for other things, but you're not ready for your death, for the next life. Your body will go to a grave one day. And Dr. King brought out in one of his messages a state of non-being. But your soul will go to hell if you have never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ in this life. That leads me to my third point, except the fact that you are on the road to hell. For Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell is a very real place. Jesus Christ preached more on hell than any person in the Bible. He preached more on hell than he did about heaven. Jesus Christ described hell as a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus Christ described hell as a place of outer darkness. At another time, Jesus Christ described hell as 
a place where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Uh, dear friend, do not die and go to hell, because hell is a terrible place. Hell is a serious place. Hell is no joke. Hell is a real place. Hell is a sad place. Hell is a bad place, and hell is bad news, dear friend. But I am here to tell you the good news. The good news is called the gospel, and Jesus Christ preached it first and best, and he said these words, which are the most loving, most caring, most wonderful, most beautiful, most magnificent words ever spoken in the history of the world to mankind. They were said by the humble and meek and quiet, loving Jesus, the miracle worker, he said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And all he wants you to do to be saved, to get saved from hell, is believe in him. He made it as simple and as easy as he possibly could do it, because everybody can believe. For whosoever, the word whosoever means anybody at any time, red, yellow, black, or white, we're all precious in God's sight. We may not be precious in each other's sight, but we're all precious in God's sight. Whosoever believeth, the word believeth means to have faith in, to trust in. Trust in who? Have faith in who? Jesus Christ. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and your destination to hell will change from hell to heaven. For Jesus said, for whosoever believeth in him, that is me, Jesus Christ, should not perish, perish, that means you will not go to hell, but have everlasting life. That means going to heaven with God and with Jesus and with the angels and with the beloved family of the people of God. Dear friend, just believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead by the power of God for you, so that you can live forever with him. Pray tonight and ask him to come into your heart to save your soul tonight, and he will save you. Here are two more verses from the Word of God, the Holy Bible, to back that up, even though it does not need to be backed up. Romans 10, 9, and 13. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth of the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved to what? Saved to heaven to be with God. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How about it tonight? I believe that this is a divine appointment, appointment for many of you. God has set you up. God is the one who has you here tonight. Wherever you uh, come from in the world, you might be in Afghanistan, you might be in India. We have a huge crowd in India. We thank the Lord for them. And you may be from uh, 
Kenya. He might be from the Philippines. Wherever you're from, I believe God is tugging at your heart. You know why I believe that? Because the gospel, the good news of God, the good news of Jesus Christ, my dear friend, has a certain power to it. It's inescapable. I can't, I can't explain it to you. That's why I preach the gospel every day. I'm throwing out the net because I know the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you could say, my wretched, half agnostic soul, he can save you and change your life. The power of the gospel is something special. And you might as well just go ahead on and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and pray and ask him to save your soul and to come into your life. If you're willing to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he suffered, he bled, and he died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose on the third day by the power of God, my dear friend, I'm willing to pray with you what I told you about earlier, the sinner's prayer. Repeat after me, phrase by phrase, and mean it from your heart. Let's pray. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have done evil in your sight. I admit that I have sinned against you, that I have broken some of your Ten Commandments. And I am guilty. And I understand that I deserve to go to hell for eternity uh, just like a criminal deserves to go to jail. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart in you, Lord Jesus. I believe with all of my heart, Lord Jesus Christ, that you suffered, you bled, and you died on the cross for my sins. Was buried and rose on the third day by God's power. Lord Jesus Christ, please come into my heart and into my spirit and save my soul from the hell that I deserve. And please save me to the heaven that I do not deserve. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of all of my sins. Help me to turn from my evil life and help me to follow you in the new life, Lord Jesus. For it is in your holy name I do pray, Lord Jesus, amen. Now, dear friend of mine, if you just believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, and you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it from your heart, I declare to you that based upon the Word of God, the Holy Bible, you are now saved from hell and you are on your way to heaven. Welcome to the family of God, dear friend. Congratulations on believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have done the most important thing in life. For more information, to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com and uh, read my book titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. 
by me if any man enter in he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture until next time my beloved god loves you we love you and may god bless you real good is my prayer now if you have a prayer list you heard us pray over the prayer list tonight uh, please put my name on it and our ministry's name and uh, make sure you pray without ceasing for yourself and for your family keep your heart and mind stayed on the lord and he will keep you in perfect peace if the lord tarries is coming and we live and nothing happens by the grace of god we'll be here tomorrow morning with the standing between the living and the dead service just one service uh, tomorrow morning at around 11 o'clock eastern 10 o'clock central 8 o'clock pacific and we'll love to have you god blessings be upon you may god bless you and keep you is my prayer let's all stand for our closing prayer Holy Father God in heaven, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you for this Wednesday night service. We praise you and we thank you for the privilege to be here and to pray and to read your holy word and to uh, preach on prayer again and to preach the gospel. We pray, Lord, for over three million souls to come to know your Savior, three million Christians to be revived through this ministry alone, and millions more to be saved through other ministries. Now, Lord, I pray as we depart from this place, help us to be prayerful, sober-minded, vigilant, and watchful. Please rebuke and bind the devil, his demons, and his hosts. Lord, from each and every one of our lives, our families, and ministries, and churches, in Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. God bless you, dear friends. Until next time.